Acts 20, verses 17 to 38. Scripture says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not, sh- I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men that were with me. In everything, I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said all these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they begin to weep aloud, and, do, and he embraced Paul, and br- embraced Paul, and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they should not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. Let's pray. Lord, as we look at these words again for the third week, we're again impressed with this uh, tremendous example Paul set of service to to the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that he set this great example because he followed Christ. And, and, and we know that he said often to people in, this, in the New Testament, follow me as I follow Christ. Pray that we would do that. We would learn from his example, Lord. We, uh, as he served Christ, we would as well in humility and, uh, and, and, and sincerity and in truth, Lord. We pray today for Mike as he preaches your word, that your blessing would be upon him, that your hand of blessing would be evident in him, that the Holy Spirit would work in, through him today and help him to preach your word in such a way that people hear and listen and that, the word is received by all. We pray for the lost today, that they will come to know Christ. We pray for believers that, that we will respond to, to your truth in a way that would please you. We just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Definitely good to be with you again this morning, looking at the Word of God. We continue on in this passage. Uh, The hope is today I'll actually finish it. I confess as I've gone through this, it has been uh, truly fruitful encouraging, convicting, all of the above for my own life. And as I've examined this passage, I have been brought to the end of myself numerous times and saw just how much I need the Lord in order for me to look like this shepherd, the Apostle Paul. If you ever read the Word and see just how far you have to go before you're the man or woman God wants you to be, maybe you're a parent and you see just how 
far you fall short of reflecting your own heavenly father. Or maybe you're an employee and you see just how far you fail at being a servant like Jesus. Or maybe you're a son or daughter here today and you see just how much you fail to honor your parents that God gave you. Well, we're all in good company. That's what scripture does to us, right? There's really only one perfect father. There's only one perfect servant. There's really only one perfect son. His name is Jesus Christ. Today we can continue our series on shepherding the flock of God. And like I mentioned, as I've studied this passage, I've been highly convicted. As I studied the apostle Paul and his love for the sheep, I have been humbled. It has driven me to the Lord numerous times. And I confess I see how far I have to go. I have a million miles to go. Thankfully, I've been reminded in my study, God uses imperfect shepherds to tend his sheep. And a passage I was reminded of during this study was that of Jesus' instruction to the apostle Peter after his death, burial, and resurrection in John chapter 21. Do you remember? Where he says to Peter... After Peter had rejected him three times, denied him three times, he says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I do. I love you. And Jesus says, tend my sheep. Do you love me? You know I love you. Shepherd the flock. God used an imperfect man like the Apostle Peter to shepherd the flock of God. A man that had denied him three times, he restores and he says, you're going to shepherd my sheep. It's good news, folks. Though we all fail and we all blow it, Jesus uses imperfect people to shepherd his flock. Parents, the same goes for you. God uses broken, repentant parents to shepherd children. Praise God. God uses broken, repentant employees to to show people about service to God. So as we go through this passage, we will all be convicted, if we're a believer that is, but there's hope. God never rejects a broken and contrite heart. Praise the Lamb. Instead, He gives enormous grace to all of us who humbly come to Him and say, God, I need you. He loves us. Isn't that good news? And so as we reflect today and continue on the study of the shepherd and what a shepherd does, all you grandparents out there, all you parents out there, all you employers out there, that see your frailty, run to the shepherd. Know that he is good. Remember our setting. Paul is headed towards Jerusalem. He sails past Ephesus to Miletus, and the the purpose being that he would stop in just to say goodbye to the elders. The elders come out to him, and he gives this farewell address to encourage the elders from Ephesus. This is a little mini epistle in verses 18 through 35. It's almost like another 2 Timothy, but in short form. It's excellent. It gives us the heart of a shepherd. It shows us what shepherding's all about. Last week we learned that the shepherd of God's flock is ultimately serving the Lord. We are serving our master, our shepherd. Second, we saw... A shepherd solemnly proclaims the word to the sheep. He proclaims it all the time. He proclaims all of it. He proclaims it with all of his heart committed to the sheep. And we left off scene third. A shepherd sacrificially loves the sheep. Now today, Paul's going to conclude his farewell address with five exhortations for his replacement shepherds. These guys are going to take his place and he's saying to them, this is what you need to do. Now you need to go shepherd the flock of God. And how do you do it? He gives five. He says, diligently tend the flock of God. We'll see this as we go through verse 28. 
alertly guard the flock of God in verses 29 and 30. Faithfully serve the flock of God in verse 31. Dependently shepherd the flock of God in verse 32. And finally we'll see sacrificially give yourself to the flock of God in verses 33 to 35. Today we all need to take this message to heart and examine where we could be more like our good shepherd towards others. And when we see our need and our failures, you're going to see them, we must turn to him for grace to accomplish what he wants us to do. So let's start with this first encouragement. Diligently tend the flock of God. Look again at verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his blood. What does it look like to diligently tend the flock of God? Well, real simple, we must be careful. We must be careful. Paul encourages the elders here, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Pay careful attention. This means be in a state of alert. Be concerned about. Be in a state of compassionate concern for something. At the most basic level, shepherding is thinking about others, thinking about the sheep, being concerned for their well-being. But notice he starts here with saying, you must be concerned for yourself. You must pay attention to yourself. We must be personally engaged. What does he mean here? We must be personally concerned for ourselves. And now at this point, we're talking about the Apostle Paul, the one that says all the time, I don't even consider myself of anything. Why would he then tell them, pay careful attention to yourself? If we were to all pay careful attention to ourselves, what would we be? It would be a disaster, wouldn't it? If we were always looking at ourselves? He obviously doesn't mean that. <laughs> He wouldn't conflict himself in the same sermon, right? What's he saying? He's talking about our sin. He's talking about our doctrine. He's talking about what we teach. He's talking about what we think on. Paul's point here is be concerned, be concerned with examining your own holiness. Watch out for your hearts. Look and see if there's any unrepentant sin in your life. Examine your doctrine. Examine your teaching. Beloved, this is where being a great shepherd starts. It starts especially with us fallen people. It starts with examining our own hearts. See, if we're not paying careful attention to ourselves, we're going to fall into sin and we're going to use this as a uh, uh, the, the pulpit as a beat stick or the Bible as beating our children verbally to get them to do what we wanted to do. But if we're reading the scriptures and we understand the scriptures, we're going to look at our own hearts and see what? we got a long ways to go. Be concerned with your own heart. Many times, many people in this world want to be leaders. <laughs> We're right now going through this election process and everybody wants to be the president. Thankfully, there's a few less now. Seems like they're, everybody comes out of the woodworks wanting to be the leader. But most of the time, they do it without a concern for examining their own lives. That's what the problem is with many leaders in America and around the world is most leaders are more concerned with telling people what to do instead of examining themselves first. However, a true shepherd of God is always self-admonishing first. Who's the first person we preach to in the morning? Ourself. You know, this goes for every shepherding opportunity we have, too, folks. Parents, you should be hardest on yourself, not your kids. 
teachers. You should be harder on yourself than your students. Managers, you should be harder on yourself than your employees. Mentors, you should always be toughest on yourself over those you're trying to mentor. And this goes for pastors and shepherds, right? All of us that are so focused on telling others what to do without looking at our own hearts and how we need help and how we need to improve, we're not ready to be shepherds. We should not be shepherding anybody. Again, as I went through this, I, I just was struck. And i got to continue to examine my own heart. Who am I the hardest on? It must be me. It must drive me to the cross. It must drive me to Christ. How about you? Who are you hardest on? In your world. Is it everybody else or you? Now that doesn't mean we fall into self-pity. But what it does mean is is that we run to Christ. And we confess our sins. And then we're ready to shepherd other people. This is the order. All true shepherds examine themselves first and foremost. So shepherds must be careful. And they must be personal, but they also must be thorough. Look, it says, pay careful attention to all the flock. This is where shepherding like the good shepherd is really seen. What does the gospel record, one of the gospels, and what does the good shepherd do? He leaves the flock flock behind when one strays. He's concerned for even... The straying sheep, the one that's going away. Every sheep has a special place in the good shepherd's heart. And that's what shepherds should be about. We should be concerned for those that are straying. Often the one hurting the most gets the most attention. That's normal. Now, that doesn't mean that if, 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 some, if one of you is just ha- always has a problem that you should always get all of our attention. But, but we must understand something. Shepherds are concerned with hurting people. And beloved, I, I think sometimes we fail to do this even in our shepherding of our children, don't we? We often, the ones that we are gravitate, gravitate to in our children are the ones that are the easiest. The ones that just kind of tell us what we want to hear. (laughs) The ones that run up to us and always are saying, Daddy, I love you. Not the one that always seems to be falling down and scratching their knees. Beloved, a, a good shepherd pays careful attention to all the flock. We're concerned for all people. So a shepherd is careful, he's personal, and he's thorough. Why should the shepherd diligently shepherd all the flock of God? Well, he says in this passage, For the shepherd, the pastor, the elder, God has called the shepherd to a task. Look, it says, The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. Ultimately, elders and pastors are made elders and pastors by God. God does it. Now you say, well, how does that process happen? Well, I'm not going to go into great detail. We know that the Holy Spirit does it, but ultimately there is confirmation from the other elders and from other people. And people say, yep, that's a shepherd. And it's obvious they have the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3. And so the Holy Spirit puts them in that role, but they're confirmed by others, and that's how God uses to show that he has established them that way. We tend to diligently... uh, We tend diligently because God has called us to this position and we are humbled by that. Not thinking that we are deserving of it by any stretch of the imagination, but we humbly serve because this is what God's given us to do. And that's the same for everybody. That's the same for every role that you have here. Do you understand that some of you might be called to be a postman, one of us in particular? That's what God's put you in. And if you're there in his providence, that's where you are. And so your calling, for lack of a better term, is to represent Christ where you are. 
Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. You're a shepherd of little children. That is your calling. And God has put you there. So what should you do? Take it serious. This is what God's called you to do. So shepherd the flock that God has given you. The flock of God is ultimately bought by God. And that drives us, doesn't it? It causes us to serve the sheep. And notice it says, which he obtained with his own blood. The heart of a shepherd is concerned for the care of the sheep because they are our blood-bought brothers and sisters in Christ. What makes me study? What's one of the reasons why I study to present this truth to you? Why are we supposed to be doing this as shepherds? Because you're blood-bought sheep. (laughs) Because you're my brothers and sisters and God loves you. It's the same thing that we know with husbands and wives, right? Husbands love their wives. Why do they love their wives? Because Christ loved them and because Christ loved their wife. Christ died for her. So what do we do? We lay down our lives for each other. And we serve the roles that God's given us because we understand that glorious gospel. So first, Paul exhorted the under shepherds to diligently tend the flock of God. Next, he exhorted them to alertly guard the flock of God. Look in verse 29 and 30. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Why must a shepherd alertly guard the flock of God? Well, the answer is simple. Because there are fierce attacks from outside that are coming. Now, what Paul says here, he speaks prophetically. But the question is, is he speaking as if he knows for sure it's going to come? In other words, he has a specific person in mind? Or is he talking, this is the direction that all things go? I tend to lean that that's what he's talking about. I don't think he has somebody specifically in mind or one of these elders, oh, this elder over here, he's a bad one. I don't necessarily think he knows that. I think his focus is is that guess what happens in churches? There's attacks that come from outside. And guess what? There's attacks that come from within too. And so why are we supposed to alertly guard the flock of God? Because... Paul states, I know after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Let me ask you a question. Was Paul a pessimist or a realist? (laughs) He was a realist. He was a realist. Sometimes us realists are called pessimists. People are like, oh, you're always finding something wrong. (laughs) You're always thinking something bad's going to happen. No. Beloved, we're realists. We live in a lost world. (laughs) And the enemy absolutely hates the flock of God. And so what's he going to do? He's going to attack it. He's going to send in from the outside and he's going to raise up from inside. That's what he's doing. Was Paul a skeptic or a critic? (laughs) I don't think he was a skeptic, but I, I, I guarantee you he was critical of a lot of things. He was watching and alert. Now, I know that sometimes people can say, man, you're way too critical. You're watching every little thing that's going on. Why? Because I'm afraid. (laughs) I'm concerned, not in a fearful, oh, no, God's lost control, but it's a natural concern of a shepherd. Isn't that what parents are? I mean, does that make you a bad parent? If you want to know who the kids are that you pl- that play with your kids, that doesn't make you a bad parent. That makes you a wise parent. That's called shepherding your children. Beloved, shepherding understands that there are wolves out there trying to devour the sheep. So we're always watching. Notice also the deceptive attack comes from within. 
He says, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. This was a case of wolves in shepherd's clothing. Beloved, I think in some ways that's even scarier than wolves in sheep's clothing. Would you not agree? Wolves in shepherd's clothing are those that look like a shepherd, but in fact are wolves trying to destroy the sheep. Friends, this is what happens, and this is why we're not quick to appoint more elders. <laughs> we want to be intentional with this. We want to take our time. Beloved, we need to be this way, don't we? The worst possible thing is, is that we raise up someone that then leads away people. And again, we understand that this is the enemy's plan, right? This is his attack. Let me ask you a question. Can we ever be too careful and concerned for the flock of God? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think we should be diligent. And concerned all the time. He says it. Pay careful attention. Be alert. Now, does that mean that we stop trusting the Lord to take care of things? No. But we are careful. Both, right? God is sovereign. Man is responsible. We're fulfilling our human responsibility. What is the aim of the enemy? You see it in this passage. Destruction of the flock. It says, not sparing the flock. That's the enemy's plan. Do you understand? He wants to destroy you. Every single one of you, if he could. He wants to take every one of you down. That's scary, isn't it? In light of that, as shepherds, we should be always diligent to watch and see who is influencing you. Look, the lie of the enemy is, move on for a better opportunity. But often, this can lead to death. The guys and I, the elders, we've talked a little bit about the, the fringe people. Those people that kind of are here, but they're not always here. and They're very rarely here. They're sometimes here. And those people really scare us. We're really concerned for them. We want all of you to take note of that. We all need to know who we are and participate in each other's lives. Now, I'm not talking about if you go on a vacation or something like that. But I'm talking about those that show up occasionally. They need shepherding. And, and, and if you're one of those sheep and you're here and you're one of the occasional shoppers, we'd ask you, please, be more consistent. Be more involved. Help us shepherd you. We want to. Folks, we've got to do that. We'd do the same thing with our children, wouldn't we? If one of our children starts to recluse and stay away from us, what do we do as parents? We get closer. We go in and we do whatever it takes to be around them, to know them, to enjoy them. That's what shepherding is. That's what Paul tells these elders to do. Because after all, they will not. Spare the flock. The enemy wants them gone, dead, destroyed. And he does it by drawing the way the disciples after them. Notice, draw away or proselyte them. Oh, this is one of those. I'll, I'll tell you what, when, when people come on screen and they become uh, famous real quick, you know those guys, those preachers that become real quick overnight, and you're like, wow, where did this guy come from? And you hear him speak and you go, wow, he can really communicate very well. I'm always leery of those kind of guys. It, the guys that are stumbling over their words a little bit more, I'll, I'll take that guy. Not the polished guy. Not the one that everybody goes, this is the most amazing guy I've ever heard. Those scare me. Why? Because that's very attractive to people. I want the normal guy, the guy that you can see is real and genuine and talks about the glory of Christ more than his own glory. Beloved, that's 
what the enemy tries to do, he tries to deceive and draw away the flock by proselyting and showing them and deceiving them this special speaker or whatever. That's why I like conferences. I go to one once a year. But as a whole, you know those conferences? They don't do it. Not for me. You know why? Because I think it's this every week. It's the Wednesday nights, as Floyd mentioned this week, where we're interacting and we're talking and communicating about the word. That's where you're really being shepherded. That's when you're really confronted with your sin. And it keeps coming up over and over and over again. Friends, this is what shepherding is. It's not about just being entertained or a smooth talker. So Paul exhorted the under-shepherds to diligently tend and alertly guard the flock of God. Next we see to faithfully serve the flock of God. Look at verse 31. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. What does faithfully serving the flock of God look like? Well, a shepherd must be fully aware of what's coming. Like it says, therefore be alert. Therefore looks back to the previous warnings as we've already seen, but it also is tied to Paul's previous shepherding where he says, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. Folks, we must be on the alert. It means to be in a constant state of readiness, be watchful, be vigilant. Who was this watchful shepherd that they had seen? It was Paul. He was watchful. He was diligent. He was vigilant. He was working night and day, as it says. He was the example of a shepherd. Shepherds don't stare at one two, one sheep too long. You know why? Because the others will drift away. I know sometimes y'all are... y'all. Wonder what in the world Pastor Mike's doing. I'm not that guy that stands up at the front and y'all come up and talk to me. It doesn't always work that way. Have you ever noticed on Sunday mornings what I'm doing? Often I'll walk out and I, I walk and I try to make my way all the way around the room. I'll even go in the other room in the overflow room and just kind of shake hands and say hi. I'm more like a sheepdog on Sunday, morning, uh, Sunday mornings than a shepherd. I'm trying to circle all of you. I'm looking. I'm looking for hurting people. I'm looking for those that might be causing problems or having an agitation. I'm looking for fires, for lack of a better term. But as a whole, Sunday morning is just kind of cover all the sheep. Find out where I need to spend more time on a one-on-one basis. So if you wonder why I don't spend an hour and a half or 30 minutes talking to one person, the reason why is because I want to do that in private. As a lady, I want to have my wife there, and I want to speak and counsel. That's what shepherds do. We're always watching, right? That's how parents are when they take their kids out, right? You see these homeschool moms at a playground? It's amazing. Where, where are the kids? One, two, three, four, five. They know exactly where all their kids are all the time. But at the same time, they know when they're hurting. One of them's hurting. They know how to deal with those specific issues. That's what shepherds do. They're on the alert always. The faithful shepherd must know what it takes. And he knows what it takes because Paul showed him. Look, he says, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish you, every one with tears. Shepherding is not taught, it's caught. The, they saw Paul shepherd. They had seen him display these shepherds' characteristics. They saw him night and day do this. So what does it take? We see it here. Continuous one-on-one -on -one service. For three years, he was consistent. He was continuously serving the people. He was constantly, night and day, with unceasing service, looking to all the flock and working with them. It takes one, a, a continuous one-on-one -on -one service. But also notice it says compassionate admonishment. Or he says admonishing everyone with tears. How many of you like to be told what to do? There's one. That's good. No, that's good. I don't mind that. 
That's great. Only if it's a good thing. Amen. I don't mind being told what to do if it's something that I want to do, right? But the fact of the matter is, is that Scripture doesn't always work that way, does it? Scripture wants us to do things that we what? Don't want to do sometimes, right? So what does the shepherd do? If he sees somebody that needs to do something and they're not doing it, and the Scripture says to do it, what does a good shepherd do? The good shepherd goes to the person and admonishes them anyway. A good shepherd goes ahead and counsels them. Now, does he do it in a harsh, overbearing, lording kind of way? No. I think his point here is, is he admonishes everyone with what? Tears. Which implies what? Compassion. He's concerned for people. Some of you all say that when you get together with me in the counseling room, you say it's like, it can sometimes be real painful. Yes, it can. But just know that I do it only because I love you and I'm concerned for you. That's, and by the way, when I get around Mark sometimes, he does the same pain to me. And he does it in a way that he doesn't even know that he's doing it hard. <laughs> he's admonishing me and I'm going, yeah, I know, I know. You saw that, you know. We're all admonishing one another, aren't we? And we do it with compassion. The admonishment did not come without compassion. It had tears. Beloved, do you have anybody in your life that speaks this kind of truth to you? Do you have people that speak truth to you and will actually cry with you over a sin that you're wanting to kill? I want to make disciples. And the only way that happens is if we have people really speaking truth to us with compassion. By the way, again, it's not always one-sided. <laughs> if you're the only one that's always tell making everybody else cry, there's a problem, correct? Again, it starts with ourself and our own heart. So Paul exhorted the under-shepherds to diligently tend alertly guard and faithfully shepherd the flock of God. Next, he exhorts them to dependently shepherd the flock of God in verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. At first glance, this sentence appears to be a little out of place. Paul was telling them what to do. Paul was telling them what to do. And then it seems that he turns and says, I commend you to God. And he stops addressing them directly. Instead, he gives them a glimpse into his own heart's commitment to God. And again, this is such a beautiful picture. We have this twofold idea going on through Paul's exhortation. First, he reveals who Paul is ultimately relying on. He's saying, look, I'm dependent upon the Lord. Second, he encourages them to rely upon the same Lord and to be committed to the same Lord to accomplish their shepherding. With this one sentence, Paul says, I am totally dependent upon God and his word to continue his work in you. I know God is the one that's going to do the work. That's what he's saying. He's trusting in what? God's sovereign care, his shepherding of the people. At the same time, he's instructing them on how to shepherd. And he's telling them before what they should do. This is an amazing letter or a, a little speech or address to him. At the same time, he gives us another example of what it takes to shepherd the flock of God. Total dependence upon God and his word. That's how you shepherd people. Again, Paul exhorts them through his example. He says, in effect, tr entrust themselves to the flock and the flock to God. He says, I now commend you to God. The word commend means to entrust someone to the care of or the protection of someone. And then he says, to God, entrust themselves to and the flock to God's word. 
He says, I commend you to the word of his grace. The shepherd gets trusting in the Lord and he gets and understands that the only way that sheep walk with God is through the word of God's grace and by the sovereign protection of the shepherd. And so he says, look, in effect, you're God's. You're God's possession. I give you to God. God's going to take care of you. Beloved, I was reminded of a story, John and Betty Stams. Y'all know the story of John and Betty Stams? Missionaries to China in the 1930s. In 1934, they arrived in China. At the same time, the Chinese Civil War was taking place. On December 7th, the communists came in and took John Stam and said, you must stop. You must come with us. Took him captive and then came back and got Betty and their little newborn child, Helen, and brought them with them. As they did, they, they brought them in and they interrogated them. They spent one night and then they started to trek the next day. They were taking them to another location 12 miles away. After interrogating them for many, time, for many hours... They said, you must come with us. Betty was given a little bit of time to get Helen ready. Instead, she left their little daughter in the clothes in the house all alone and went with her husband, leaving this little baby behind. And the two went off. They walked for a couple of miles, and then finally the guards beheaded John and turned around and killed Betty. When you hear stories like this, you go, what in the world? How could they do this? These two understood something. They understood who was the ultimate shepherd. Betty understood. And she entrusted Helen to be taken care of. Two days later, she, Helen was taken by a pastor and then eventually taken to her grandparents and then eventually was raised in America by her uncle and aunt. These two understood something. To live is Christ. To die is gain. They knew who was in control. They trusted in God to shepherd their daughter to take her and care for her. Are you parents like me? How many times we grabbed a hold of our children and thought, I'm the one that has to keep this little one safe. I'm the one that has to do it. Folks, one thing I have learned by parenting is is that ultimately it comes down to trusting God to parent my kids. And the best I can do is say, God, they're yours. This is called open-handed shepherding. This is saying, they're your sheep. I'm just your under-shepherd. This is where Paul was. He says, I commend them to God and to the word of his grace because the word will work in them and the word will be used by these shepherds to carry on the work by God's grace. Are you an open-handed shepherd? (laughs) Again, this doesn't mean that we're not concerned. You see that little bit of attention. We're concerned, but we do what? Trust. We're concerned, but we know that God is in control. And we go, your will be done. You are God, not me. That's what shepherds do. Why should we be dependently, uh, dependent shepherds? Well, the answer is, is because ultimately, who's the one that builds? Who's the one that edifies? Who's the one that sanctifies? Who's the one that saves? God does. And all good shepherds know that God is the good shepherd that 
sanctifies, and saves. Friends, we've got to be reminded of this all the time. We've got to be reminded with whether or not we're going to have a spouse. We've got to be reminded of this whether or not our children are going to, we're going to have children. <laughs> we've got to be reminded of this all the time. We shepherd with open hands. And we say, not our will be done, but yours be done. And we trust that God will use his word to sanctify those that are his and set apart. So Paul exhorted the under shepherds to diligently tend, alertly guard, faithfully serve, and dependently shepherd the flock. And finally we see he exhorts them to sacrificially give yourself to the flock of God. Oh, folks, get this. Look at this. This is beautiful. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. We see here Paul concludes and he calls for laying down our life for the flock of God. Once again, he makes this plea through a reflection of his own ministry. Notice in verse 35, in all these things I have shown you. Again, I can't stress this enough and I please, I want you to listen closely. How many of you want to shepherd people? How many of you want to make disciples? One of the primary ways you make disciples is by what? Showing them what disciples look like. He says it. How do you shepherd? How do you make shepherds? You show shepherds what shepherds look like. He says, in all these things I've shown you what it looks like. All too often we can quote Bible and verse. Can't we? but then our lives don't reflect what we say they need to do. Does our, uh, does our lives reflect trusting our Heavenly Father? <laughs> How many of you have ever had one of your kids come to you and say, I don't know if I want to do that. And you say, trust me. I know what's best for you. And they say, no. No. Can this be what's best for me? And you say, look, have I led you astray ever before? And you say, yeah. <laughs> Beloved, if we are trusting and faithfully seeking the Lord, guess what? Our kids are going to see who we depend upon. And as we show them what giving is all about, I talked to my kids on the way over today. It was great, great conversation in the car. We talked about this beautiful little verse at the end where he says, The Lord himself said, It is more blessed to give than receive. <laughs> and I said, I asked them, Hey, does it make you happy to give or to receive? Does it make you more happy to get something or to give something? I got some honesty. Makes me more happy to get things. And I said, but do you see that when we give something to somebody, there's a great joy in our hearts. There is happiness when we give. Do we reflect this to our life, to our children? Do we reflect it to our coworkers? Do we, folks, do we reflect this kind of living? No, we rejoice greatest when we have victories and we win or we get something. Don't we? But as we know our master and as we understand that he gave himself so that we could be blessed. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, right? What's the joy? We are his joy. 
We get to enjoy him forever. He gets to enjoy us forever. There's a relationship that's reestablished and all sin is paid for and we are going to enjoy him forever. Why did he go to the cross? Because he saw that. He saw that. Oh, beloved, is this truth? It is more blessed to give than receive. It was in Paul's life. To die to self was where I found the greatest joy. This is why I'm doing a lot of marriage counseling now. Premarital counseling, rather, not marriage counseling, but premarital counseling. Getting ready. And I try to stress this over and over and over. Expectations will kill you. Expectations will kill you. Right? You've heard me preach this over and over. Expectations in marriage will kill you. But success is found where? In giving. In sacrifice. Finding joy in serving. If every spouse in the room, can you imagine what this place would be like? If every spouse in this room was all about serving their spouse and finding joy and seeing their spouse get something, it'd be a totally different world, wouldn't it? The kids said, we gave an example. What if we went to the van every day and we all went, you can have the best seat? You know how kids are, right? I got it first, front. Shotgun. Everybody says shotgun, right? Isn't that the way it is? Especially when you ride alone with daddy. Shotgun. I want it. I want the best seat. That's what you're saying, right? Can you imagine? I think it was Luke said, well, then we'd get to the door and we'd all be going, no, you first. No, you first. No, you first. Well, well, I'm convinced it would be a lot better place, wouldn't it? (laughs) Friends, this is what our Savior showed us. This is what we see in the Apostle Paul. Avoid coveting one another's stuff. Work hard to provide for yourself and others. Sacrifice to help the weak. Live to obey the Lord's beatitude. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So when Paul finished, the question comes. With all that he said, there must be some doubt, right? Was Paul perfect? No, he wasn't perfect. But did the direction of his life look a lot like what he was saying? Oh, absolutely. How do we know that the direction of his life looked real a lot like this? Their response. Do you understand? If somebody stood up and said this and never lived this, do you understand what the sheep would say and those shepherds would say? What would they have said? <laughs> I didn't see much sacrifice from you. Hey, there were no tears. I saw some anger. I saw you lording yourself over me several times. I sure did feel beat up often. But they don't act like that, do they? Look at verse 36. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul. And he repeatedly kissed them and they and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they were accompanying him to the ship. They wept loudly after he prayed. At the end of the day, not everyone is called to be an elder or pastor in a church. But everyone has people in their lives they're called to shepherd. And whether it's a spouse or a child or a grandchild or a fellow young, younger brother or sister in the faith or neighbors or co-workers, let me ask you a question. This is the, 
knock it out of the park moment. How would they respond if you left? That's it. How would they respond if you left? Man, it's going to be a lot easier that, that now that that guy's gone. Would there be tears? <laughs> and not tears of regret, like, man, I wish I would have had a better relationship with this guy. Would there be genuine tears of, oh, wow, I had a reflection of the good shepherd in my life. We all need to tend the sheep like this guy. I want to be like this guy. It only happens by the grace of God. So I want to take a moment here. I want to show you something. I want all people under 18 to stand up. All people under 18 stand up. All children and all 18-year-olds stand up. Okay, can y'all come up here? Thank you. Come on up here. Come on up here. Yep, just, oh, yeah, y'all can go on. Go on up there. It's good, yeah. Go on up there. Come on, Zeke, you want to come? You don't have to. Anybody wants to come, come on up here. Thank you. Go on up. Come on. Come on. Wow, look at that. Let the little ones go to the front, okay? Let the little ones go to the front. Way to go. Here, you want some help? Here. Okay. Here. You hold her, okay? Make sure. Okay. Here we go. Look at this. Okay. Okay. Come here. Okay. There. There we go. We have plenty of sheep, don't we? Beloved. You're wondering, do I have somebody I could shepherd? Answer. Can you imagine if a whole church got on fire just to take care of these people? This is what it's about. Let's shepherd these sheep. I'm going to pray for them. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for these children. We praise you for what you have blessed us with. We ask that you will make them men and women after your heart. We pray that you will help them to grow up to love your word. We pray that you will help us to shepherd them in a way that they see Jesus in us. We love you, Father. We thank you for the privilege you've given us. Help us to shepherd the flock of God. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus our Savior.